Alrighty. How's everybody doing? Is this nap time? It's fantastic. Um, I guess I'll introduce myself. I'm Jared Chambers with ATP Nutrition and uh, thanks to the Farming Smarter group. They sent me a note a couple of months ago and said, would you do a talk on biostimulants uh, in the field? Which of course is uh, an interesting conversation to have at any time, let alone in the field. So I guess this is really just a backdrop. Um, so a couple of people, if you have more clarifications, is our is a couple of people that work at ATP is uh, Steve Levitt, who's at the back of the white hat, handing things out, as well as Bill Zimmer, who's at the back. Uh, Steve's just out of Lethbridge area, Bill's out of Calgary. Uh, we're a plant nutrient company, but we spent uh, probably 15, 20 years actually in the biostimulant space at different, at different uh, stages of my uh, career. Um, and it's a very complicated topic, which is why we have the handout that we may or may not go through it. It's just there as a reference. How many people have heard about biostimulants? How many people have used biostimulants? How many people are confused by biostimulants? Okay, excellent. We'll just stop at that point. So my goal here as a company, so this is a couple of things. I think I was telling Daryl this at lunch. My goal here as a company is to try to take the complex and make it simple. However, today we're not gonna do that, okay? because there's a precursor for making the complex simple. We can do it two ways. We can either dumb things down or we can smarten things up. So you sitting there in the crowd, you have two choices. I can either make you dumber or make you smarter. The problem is in a complicated space like biostimulants, people wanna dumb it down and you really don't know what is going on anymore. So what I'm gonna do here today is try to raise some questions, raise some discussions, attempt to smarten you up, and probably at the end of the day, make you a little bit more confused than you were with before you started. But when we think about biostimulants, and I'm gonna go through these slides, you're gonna see this five ring circle that I've put out through the various uh, areas. This is on the International uh, Biostimulant Conference. They've kind of broken down, if you think biostimulants are complicated, well, again, we're gonna make it more complicated to start. They've broken it down into five key families of products. So think of it this way, how many different, different families are there herbicides? You don't have to answer it. There's more than one, right? At the end of the day, what's the purpose of a herbicide? Thank you. Biostimulants, there's more than one family. What's the purpose of all these? Thank you. That's a simple, so let's, we're gonna keep it simple, right? But again, now let's dig into these five families. So there's a couple of slides here that I don't know if I'm gonna read about, but I think a key thing I wanna highlight is a lot of times what happens with biostimulants, where it gets confusing is some of them are natural, some of them are synthetic, they are not a fertilizer, and they're not a replacement for a fertilizer. Think about them uh, metaphorically. We can use very many different analogies that we want. One of the easiest ones that I like to use is thinking about a car engine and you put a turbocharger on it. Your biostimulant is your turbocharger and your car engine. Your car engine is running perfectly. You have your spark plugs, you have everything hooked up. You put on this turbocharger, but you forget to put fuel in the tank. How much faster and farther do you go with no fuel? Not very far. Your fuel is your fertilizer. So if you don't have your fertilizer there to power everything, the biostimulant doesn't, do its, doesn't actually do what it can do. So you can read that they're microbial, they're synthetic, they're natural. The whole idea is they can go on with the soil, with the seed, with the foliars. They're not new. This is what the bottom slide is talking about. Since about the 1950s, these have been broken down into the five different families. And the five different families, I guess we should highlight, is the seaweed family. Is, the hormones, this is the one that people are most comfortable with, or maybe not most comfortable they've heard about it. But one of the other families is what's also called the humic acid or the fulvic acid or the soluble organic matter. How many people have heard of those? Thank you. How many people have heard of the seaweeds? Okay, now we start getting a little bit more. How many people have heard of uh, plant extracts? Wow, okay, that's more than I thought. And now we have these protein hydrolysates and amino acids, okay. No, good, no hands came up on that one, okay. And then of course we actually have biologicals. So this becomes a very interesting play that they're actually saying that microorganisms are a biostimulant. 
Now we're going to not talk about that today, but I'll just touch on it here briefly. And that's quite an interesting discussion. Why do you think, knowing not because we haven't gone through the biostimulants as a whole, anybody have an idea why they think a, a microorganism or a microbiology or biological product may become a biostimulant? Exactly. Somebody said the answer exactly because a, a microorganism has a tendency to release a whole bunch of metabolites and a whole bunch of different compounds that the plant then can utilize as a, as a food source. They could be amino acids, they could be some type of fatty acid, they could be a polysaccharide, they could be different things. So as a result, we're actually putting on some microorganisms we put on to fix nitrogen. Some microorganisms we put on such as a jump start to increase the root surface area or a mycorrhizae, we put on mycorrhizae to work in symbiotic relationship with the root system to increase root surface area. Other organisms such as, as a bacillus, they're going to be releasing metabolites that then actually work as a biostimulant. So that's as much as we're going to talk about biostimulants in microbials, but you can see why it gets confusing. Now the interesting piece, when you hear about biostimulants and, and people try to dumb it down, they'll tell you all the positive things that it does. And that's really what this bottom right hand corner is talking about. And I'm not going to go through it, but if you actually look at the two that are highlighted in green, everything you say about fertilizer is what you say about a biostimulant. The only variable is a biostimulant will also deal with stress in a plant. Now this becomes critical. We're going to come back to this stress comment later because this is a key thing that it does, but we need to understand what we need by stress and it just lays out better uh, when we're going to talk about it later in a great, a great example talking about stress. So if we think about the first, outside of the biologic, we think about the first main biostimulant family that a lot of people heard of, and that's hormones or seaweeds. People have heard of that? How many people have used it? Nobody's used hormones? Seaweeds? Okay, somebody has. So that's really what this whole next page is talking about. And I'm not going to go into details. This is actually simplification of the real presentation. Uh, but it, it really gets complicated. So seaweeds, of course, they come from the ocean. They're rich in a lot of nutrients from the different oceans. They're also rich in a lot of hormones. And the main hormones that they can be rich in that are important for crop production, for stimulatory effects, are hormones such as auxins, cytokinins, and gibberellins. There's five main hormones that exist as a sort of big families, the three that I just referred to, plus ethylene, plus abscisic acid. Now, ethylene and abscisic acid, those are usually bad hormones, and auxins and cytokinins are good hormones, and this is what all these slides talk about. But the great thing about hormones is it's a case, if a little is good, a lot is bad. You're going to go, what are you talking about? How many people have ever had, um, uh, is anybody allergic to poison ivy? And ever put on, you guys don't get poison ivy in southern Alberta, do you? If you do, right? If you're allergic, sometimes what do you get put on your, if, you get, if you're quite allergic to it? You get a steroid put on it, right? It's like a hormone. How many people have put on too much steroids? Legalized, by the way. I'm not saying illegal steroids. What does it kind of do to you? Steroids, think about when people want to pump iron, they put a lot of steroids on. What happens to their body sometimes? Be gross, exactly. But besides the muscles, you start getting a lot, of, a lot of pimples, your body kind of starts reacting. This is an example of a little is good, a lot is not better. So the key things with all these products, when I said ethylene is bad and abscisic acid is bad, it's bad when it's at a level that's higher than normally exists in the plant. These five hormones exist in the plant. But a lot of times, because they're tied to nutrition, and if we are out of balance with nutrition, we can get out of balance with hormones. So this is where all of these slides here that I'm not going to go through explain the importance of auxin for auxin domination, which is really at the growing points of the plant. We talk about another nutrient called cytokinin, it's another hormone called cytokinin. And this is on, on the bottom page here and on the top page here. You can see I'm trying to highlight the importance of balanced hormones. A lot of times we talk about balanced plant nutrition. Here we're talking about balanced hormones that we need the right ratio of auxins to cytokinins. And, and you know, uh, visually we just showed if the ratios are different, the plant responds differently because they have different roles. 
Then we have gibberellic acid, we have ethylene, we have cystic acid, um, and these are all biostimulant type of effects. Now we also have plant growth regulators, which are slightly different. How many people are familiar with plant growth regulator? And what's the name of the one that's on the market right now? Thank you. And why is manipulator a, a, a plant growth regulator, not a biostimulant? Because it shortens things, right? Rather than stimulates things. But what's interesting that not page three, bottom right hand corner is a really nice summary of when the different hormones really bring value to a crop at the different stages in the plant's life cycle and how it ties to nutrients. Ultimately, what you're trying to do with any of these biostimulants is harness the power of your nutrient and usually in the case driving rooting or driving lateral branching or maybe breaking apical dominance. It depends upon what you want to accomplish with it. So it's really not one shot meets all needs. Some of them you want to have them early on to drive rooting where you're looking really at the cytokines and maybe the auxins early on to drive rooting. But then later on, come maturity, you want more of the abscisic acid or ethylene for, for maturity purposes. So again, it's not, you can put it on every crop at every stage in the plant's life cycle. That's not a good idea. So it's a very complicated area that uh, I've tried to butcher here in the last few slides to kind of say this is a neat area, but most hormones are driven by seaweed extracts from seaweeds from different parts of the ocean. Now we're not going to get into the next piece which is on page four but the top four slides even get more complicated that as analytical tools become better we start having subfamilies with these, within these hormones. So again we're learning more. So as we learn more we start to figure things out and ultimately create more consistency in a product because as we learn more then we know what rate and what time to put it on and these are things such as brucinosteroids and polyamines and things of this nature that we're not going to get into right now. Now, because you guys aren't really using hormones right now, the bottom two slides on page four don't make a lot of sense, but I'm going to put them out here because the goal here today is to initially confuse you. So the question is here, well, you have these plant hormones that come from the ocean. Well, maybe I can just go get it in a jug and I can just go buy an oxen. I'm just going to go buy an oxen, or I'm just going to go buy a cytokinin or a gibberellin. Well, the bottom right hand corner on page four is an example that if you were to ask somebody to do a hormone analysis, this is the minimum number of hormones that exist in a plant. And I'm not going to read them, but can we say that there's lots? And they're all in different ratios and every plant requires them different ratios. So when you try to cherry pick one hormone out of something, you may be very successful somewhere else, but it may trigger something else. So this is where the natural component, natural extracts or extraction from a natural pl or a plant, really that balance is critical because you can see there's 30 or 40 different uh, uh, gibberellins and cytokines and auxins that exist there. So you'll start, as you dig into this, you'll see, you'll get more and more confused. And that's what one of my goals are here today. So is there any questions in regards to hormones besides let's keep moving because he's only on page five of 15. <laughs> okay, there's no questions. That's not very good. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go through these quickly. So we're in biostimulant. What's the purpose of these five families of biostimulants? Stimulate. stimulate, thank you. So now we're going to go through the second family that stimulates. A lot of times the outcomes are the same. And this is the amino acids or the, or the protein hydrolysates. Now I should say, I'm going to come back to the, C, uh, you know, the protein hydrolysates. That's kind of fine. And if you want to look at it, we're not going to go through it. There's a lot of amino acids, top right hand corner. These are seven different products that actually exist in your market that you're probably not aware of. And then seven is probably not seven, it's probably 17. So these are just some of the analysis that we do on them to figure out what they are. Again, we're not going to go into the details, but they're very complicated. They're generally either extracted from a plant or they're actually something that's fermented or extracted from an animal. There's a lots of different methodologies to get these amino acids in the right ratio. Again, this is just reference. The amino acids do a lot of things. The neat thing about amino acids versus hormones is the world has done a little bit better job on the role of these hormones and what they actually do in the, sorry, the role of these amino acids and what they actually do in the plant. And I know you probably can't read this, but 
I'll just try to do a couple quick examples. In the page five on the right hand side, you'll see things like methionine and arginine are very important for early season root development. So methionine and arginine are important for early season root development. It's probably the right amino acid to put on for root development. But now if you go to the next slide over here, and what you're going to see uh, to enhance fruit set is, a, is amino acids such as glutamic acid and proline. So if you want to enhance flowering and fruit set, what amino acid are you going to put on? Glutamic acid and proline, right? You're not going to put on methionine. So this is a very good piece of information because now we have the scientific community that's been able to slice up this top page, go physiologically into the plant and say what amino acid or amino acid group or amino acid family is critical for doing a certain activity in the plant, whether it's rooting, whether it's flowering, whether it's sequestering or chelation and so on and so on. So what you now have is you now you have a little bit more of a scientific based amino acid that we can really dig into. And that's really what I wanted to talk about here. So it's kind of a neat family. It's been developed back in the 50s and the 60s by the Spaniards. They've done a lot of great work with it. And now we're starting to understand what it means. Now, most of these amino acids really are not common in Western Canada, but you're going to see a large onslaught on them. Uh, we actually use them quite a bit in some of our products, uh, but you're going to see a big wave of this. And the big reason for the wave is because of understanding what they do, how they work, and now they can actually start targeting them and trying to get the best agronomic response for you. So we just use this as an example, just so I wouldn't forget. For example, the key amino acids are at flowering, are glutamic acid, proline, and GABA. So if you want to have something to target flowering, those would be the amino acids you would target. Of course, you've got to work on all the science behind it, rates, timing ratios, and so on and so on. Any questions on amino acids? He's going, you're through three out of five. We're 60% of the way there. We're past the curve. We're over the pass and we're coming down the mountain range now, right? No questions. That's not good. Thank you. Finally, a question. Yep. You want to know something? If we worry about the environment, I don't think we should farm. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm not, but you're exactly right. If it doesn't rain, if it gets hot, everything we say is out the window. Nothing replaces nutrients except nitrogen and a nitrogen fixing crop and nothing replaces water and nothing replaces heat or cold, right? So again, that is a very valid point. We do have people that talk about some of these amino acids. Actually, it's a very good point. I actually, there is uh, some work that is actually showing, um, I haven't done the work, but I read about it, where some of these ones can help with reducing the transpiration rate in the plant lowering the transpiration rate. Well, that's really cool, but that assumes that you know what Mother Nature is going to throw at us next week. And I guess if you did, then that's, then you're a lot more clever than the rest of us and you wouldn't be on this bus. You'd be somewhere in Palm Springs running your farm by an iPhone somewhere or iPad somewhere, right? But there is tools to work with that. None of this stuff, whether it's a nutrient or this. Now at the same time, a balanced, a nutrient balanced plant that's healthy, of course, is always going to ward off infection better. It's always going to deal with stresses better. And again, the next level of stresses is, again, getting into one of these biostimulant families. Derek? Yep. Uh, this is irrigation country. Uh, we can throw the kitchen sink at it. We want 80 plus uh, bushel canola, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, pedigree canola all around us. Uh, let's throw the kitchen sink at us. Uh, what can we do? Yep, you can, it's a lot. Fatalistic yeah. thinking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in that case, there, that's the bigger picture, right? That's about. First of all, you have your inputs, which are going to influence sixty percent of the genetic potential of the crop, right? Tom's company, IPNI, has put that out for years. That sixty percent of the genetic potential of the crop is influenced by proper plant nutrition. And of course, that's and that's an entire career in talking about proper plant nutrition, but that's. We got to look at seedbed utilization. We got to look at, mo uh, well, we don't have to worry about moisture, but a good seed soil contact. We got to look about balanced nutrition throughout the season. Once we have our balanced nutrition, then of course we start looking at other tools. But without the balanced nutrition, trying to address that. Um, and again, nobody's, you know, we, there's, there's challenges out there for 100 bushel canola. Nobody's hit it on dry land, but people hit it in spots. So if you hit in spots, you know that it is possible. One, 
your organic matter. Your, your, we haven't even talked about the entire soil health, which is going to be the biggest craze in the next uh, decade or two decades here on soil health, because nobody really knows what that means. But we understand the health of the soil is critical for the long-term viability and ultimately the production of the crop. So your question, Jack, should take about uh, two or three years to answer, and then we still won't even answer it at that point. But so I'm just giving generalities. Good question. What the heck does balanced nutrition mean? Balanced well, nutrition? Pet peeve words. <laughs> Who's pet peeve? Mine. Yours? Yeah, I, I just, it sounds indescript. What does it specifically mean, balanced nutrition? Balanced nutrition is mean that rather than Liebrich's law of the minimum, you work on Wallace's law of the maximum. So what it actually means is that you're working in a dynamic environment with some people say up to 140 to 160 variables that control the productivity of this crop. Nutrients are only 17 of those 150 variables, but in terms of balanced nutrition, we know through tissue sample, we know through all the work that at every stage in the plant's life cycle, it will require so much of each nutrient in a certain ratio from one versus the other. And, a, and if those ratios are out of check, then the actual photosynthetic efficiency of the plant is affected because every nutrient outside of calcium and boron and molybdenum are involved in photosynthesis. And the plant is all about making photosynthesis. So you are out of balance. That means your engine, your photosynthetic factory is not working properly. And if your photosynthetic factory is not working properly, you're not making as much energy and you're not making as much energy, you can't feed the plant. Early on, it means rooting. Later on, it means flowering. Later on, it means filling. A good example is um, how many people have seen that sometimes, uh, you guys aren't copper deficient here. Anybody copper deficient here? Okay, you're not copper deficient. Great example, we see it all the time. This, is a, this could be a great area where you actually will start putting on balanced nutrition where if you put on, you guys showed us some great work. Tom was talking earlier about putting on 60 pounds in phosphorus, getting a great response. I've also seen a lot where you actually put on 60 or 80 or 100 pounds of phosphorus and you address phosphorus, but you trigger a zinc deficiency. So you've actually taken a perfectly balanced plant at a certain yield potential, but now you've addressed phosphorus to go for that higher yield potential. And in my example I'm using here, that can trigger very easily because IPNI has done the work, actually a zinc deficiency for that high yield. So for 50 bushels of canola, 60 pounds of phosphorus was awesome. You got your 50 or 60 bushels of canola, your zinc was fine. I'm just using this as an example. You're trying to push it to 80 bushels. You put on phosphorus for 80 bushels, and all of a sudden, to go from 60 to 80, you required more zinc. There was enough zinc in the soil for balanced nutrition up to 60 bushels, but there wasn't enough there for 80, so now you got the 64 bushels. And I'm just using it zinc. It could be copper, it could be manganese, it could be magnesium. Yeah, so, I, I get what you're saying, and, I, and the way you describe it, that makes sense, but is it, is it a balanced thing, or is it sufficient amounts to meet the yield potential? It's, it's, it's the word balance that I think it, it often gets thrown out there as something magical. You know, it, is it? well, it's art. I think it's art because we'll use a couple examples and we'll come back to your question is how many people you know have read different diets to lose weight? Have they ever agreed? A balanced diet, I hear. A balanced diet, but now a ba yeah, exactly. But if you actually go and but people may have extreme diets, right? You may have extreme diets, a massive weight loss program is a silver bullet, right? Because what do you do in a massive weight loss program? You actually put your body out of balance, why? Because it then works harder to get imbalance. And in working harder to get imbalance means it burns more energy, which means you lose weight. So if a plant is out of balance, what will actually happen in extreme cases, it's called the same thing, it's called free radical buildup in a plant. Photosynthesis is not working as well, so actually, this is why you get, you, you get, like whenever you guys see, if you see a zinc deficiency or a copper deficiency or a manganese deficiency, you'll see speckling on the leaves. That's free radical buildup because what has actually happened, the plant made photosynthesis, but because you have a nutrient out of balance, and this is the three that I talked about, the oxygen doesn't come out of the plant. And what happens if the oxygen doesn't come out of a plant? Comparison, what happens if we hold our breath for a long period of time? 
we die. What happens if a plant is out of balance at the cellular level? Mm -hmm. The cell becomes toxic in oxygen and the cell ruptures. And when it ruptures, how valuable is it for photosynthesis? It's not. It's not valuable for photosynthesis. So this is where, whether we use sufficiency or balance, I think they're both excellent. I love the word sufficiency. Uh, it's a stronger word uh, than balance. And so it's something that I'll probably maybe start passing on. So I actually do appreciate that. like Tom trying not to say mobile. Well, Tom's in denial, right? Tom's in denial. <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't mean to be uh, abrasive. It's just one of those things I thought, let's just throw it out there. Uh, you know, I, I, I think it confuses people. It confuses me. But, you know, but you're supposed to be demystifying this. <laughs> you're, well, this I'm not even getting into this yet. We're not going to demystify this. We're going to do some more demystifying later. But I think what's also fun with Tom's stuff is Tom doesn't want to use the word immobile, so he says barely mobile, yeah. right? So Tom did a great job in that chart. Tom, I love your chart about mobile, sorry, barely mobile and moderately mobile and mobile nutrients. But then there's another piece about mobility or lack of mobility or limited mobility of nutrients in the plant. This is where people get confused because people don't want to talk about plant physiology just like they don't want to talk about human nutrition because we all have a different theory on a diet. But when we talk about the soil scientists, I was a soil scientist, I did my graduate work on phosphorus, I know a fair amount about phosphorus, I love the chemistry in the soil because it was actual, it was finite, it was defined. When you talk about a moving plant with sunlight and water and lack of moisture and too much moisture and salinity and and hard pans and high magnesium levels, oh my goodness, into the plant, it gets very complicated. So now we have nutrients, I think uh, earlier um, in, in uh, Tom's talk, he talked about boron being very mobile in the soil. What's the mobility of more, mo boron in the plant? Very low. Now we're starting to get confusing, right? Now we have nutrients such as calcium, mobile on the plant or not mobile on the plant? Not mobile on the plant, but they're very mobile in the soil. Let's talk about nutrients such as copper or zinc. They're not very mobile in the soil. They're not very mobile in the plant. We start talking about these different nutrients and different things. Sulfur. Sulfur is mobile in the soil. Not very mobile in the plant. Is everybody confused yet? That's why you have a table, by the way. What I'm saying, you just have a little table that shows it. So this is where you come back to sufficiency in a plant and sufficiency in the plant varies, depends upon the time of the year, because I just said if a, that some of those nutrients are mobile on the soil, placement becomes critical or not as critical, there's better residual effect, there's not, we have to think about the root architecture of the plant, but now we start thinking in the plant at flowering, there's nutrients that are required in higher doses at flowering. Nutrients, there's a lot of nutrients required at high dosing at flowering because flowering is reproduction. When you have reproduction, you have your embryo, you have everything, you have your pollen, your pollen grain sitting there, it's loaded with nutrients. But a lot of those nutrients that are required, calcium, boron, manganese, zinc, potassium, magnesium, all of those outside of the last two are not mobile in the plant, which means, or limited mobility in the plant, which means that the chance of them getting to the reproductive part of the plant at the time and the concentration it needs may be affected. So this is where Timing becomes critical, placement becomes critical, but you can't replace those. So I have no idea what it has to do with this slide deck that I'm presenting here, but I actually prefer to talk about plant nutrition over these anyway. So let's get back to a topic that I'm just enjoying talking about so much. So next topic, great questions. Humic acid, how many people heard of humic acid? How many people have heard a lot of promises about humic acid? How many people have heard that humic acid will even babysit your kids? change the tires on your vehicle, you know, roll the windows up and down and solve rain patterns and all that type of stuff, right? Here's the question, humic acid, do you want to dumb things down or do you want to smarten things up? If you, and that's, that's why it changes the kids' diapers at time, you know what I mean? So, but here's the thing about humic acid, there's been tons and tons and tons of work done on it. The key thing is you have to get into the work that's been done and the rates and the timing and before all that, the objective. Biggest users, probably the biggest agriculture users of humic acid is in the state of California and in the state of Idaho. 
Why would that be? It's kind of a difficult question. We're going to ask you anyway. Irrigation. Irrigation, that's a part of it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. That's the right answer there. Organic matter. What's the organic matter on a, on a head lettuce field? Has anybody ever seen what they do to a head lettuce field? 2.7 times a year they do it. But they take a mold bore plow, they flip it over, you harvest all the head lettuce, what do you leave in the ground? Nothing. What's the organic matter of most California soils? Nothing. What's the biological population look like when you have no organic matter? Zip. Zip. What do they do when they put strawberries on top of strawberries on top of strawberries for the last 37 years? They put on methyl bromide. What do methyl, methyl, what do methyl bromide do to everything? Nuclear. Nucle so now we have a nuked soil with no organic matter and no bugs. So what do they now do? They start to imp they start to put bugs into those soils, right? And they work. Why do they work? Because there's nothing there. What feeds the bugs? Generally, a carbon source, right? But if you have no organic matter, what's a carbon source? Humic acid but they don't put it on at one liter an acre. They put it on at a minimum of 10 to 30 gallons an acre. And why do I know that? Because I worked in California for seven years and sold millions and millions and millions of dollars of humic acid at 30 gallons an acre. But it's a dead soil. Does it work? Absolutely. Does 30 gallons of humic acid in Southern California on head lettuce work the same as one liter of humic acid on a soil with 7% organic matter? Probably not. It doesn't mean the product doesn't work, it means you're using the wrong tool. Humic acid is primarily a carbon source at a high dose rate to feed the microbial population and it does a fantastic job when you need to feed the microbial population. Okay. Very key point. We've done some really neat studies just for fun a number of years ago where we actually took an old, um, it was an old railroad bed down in southern, just over in Tabor that was all gravel. And just for fun, we actually put on, I think, about 4,000 gallons of humic acid into this little stretch in this railroad bed. And we didn't get much of a crop, but we actually grew a little bit of a crop. We actually grew a little bit of a crop, we did a biological work, and we actually got some bugs to work. So it was kind of just a proof point to show things work when you figure out your challenge. Humic acid, how many people heard of fulvic acid? How many people have heard of, uh, I'm calling it here, CPPA or soluble organic matter? Okay, now we're getting into a more area. Where we're moving away from humic acid as a carbon source CPPA, soluble organic matter, fulvic acid, what they've done is they've taken all, they're trying to take all the carbon out of the product and they're actually trying to focus in on the bile stimulants, which we refer to as the polyphenol groups, which is the tannins, the lipids, and the lignans. And that's what all these slides are trying to talk about. So once you isolate these, they have a stimulatory effect. The primary stimulation that these polyphenols give is primarily increased rooting, increased photosynthesis, which results in increased fertilizer uptake. Now I can say that because on page seven in the middle is the University of Florida did some work on genetic expression, RNA sequencing, transcription. What they basically said is they actually did different treatments and they said when you put on this transit S, this transit product, what genes does it turn on and what genes does it turn off? And I can't read them because the font's too small for me, but it basically said that it turned on 60 genes. That increased the uptake of calcium, increased the uptake of zinc, increased photosynthesis. It also turned off stress genes, such as ethylene production and the cystic acid. Now the neat thing about this, this isn't somebody walking in your field trying to sell you this product. This is actually RNA sequencing, looking at a plant at a genetic level to see what it does. And this is where the world is starting to come towards, starting to understand what is happening with these biostimulants at a stress level. Here's a great example of what it did. And I'm going to give you, uh, how many people know Dr. Mark Belmonte? 
top 40 researcher under 40 in Canada, one of the top plant geneticists uh, around as a seed specialist. He's done some great work for Bayer and Monsanto, I'm sorry, Bayer and I guess Bayer twice now, but I guess yesterday it was Bayer and Monsanto. Um, on some great work, he's done a lot of great stuff. We, we commissioned him to do some work on a biostimulant. And what we did is we put the plant, this is really interesting, we, and he did all the transcription and genetic expression work. One time we made the plant cold stressed, one time we made the plant water stressed, and one time we made the plant zinc stressed. Now I thought what was really interesting, this is a great example because all the genetic work was done. There was no antidotal connect the dots, the dots were all connected. I think the most interesting one was what it did under those conditions. When the plant was cold, under cold conditions, and you put on this biostimulant, it told the plant at the genetic level, you are not cold. Start growing roots and germinate. Now. What happens if it stays cold? Dies, exactly. We're gonna bypass the water stress because it's the same story. It told the plant not to be water stressed. The one that I thought was the most interesting was in the third series of experiments, we made the plant zinc deficient, intentionally zinc deficient. It was a part of a bigger project. And what it actually told the plant to do, I don't think I put it on in here. Actually I did, on page eight, in this funny little chart here, that you're not going to under, maybe understand because of I bypassed lots and lots of slides. It actually turned on gene. It knew the plant was zinc deficient. Zinc has a lot of roles in the plant. When you put on this biostimulant, it said to the plant, please turn on zinc ion transport and zinc transmembrane transport and zinc transmittal transporter activity and zinc this and zinc that. It said to the plant, I'm not zinc deficient. Isn't that cool? But what happens if you don't put on zinc? It dies. That's the second cool part. So it can temporarily fix a stress as long as you're there to do it properly afterwards or at the same time. It's like putting, it's like putting a band-aid on something, but knowing very quickly you gotta rebuild that piece. So this is why I wanted to delay the entire stress component. These biostimulants, I don't care if it's the amino acids, if the plant extracts, if it's the CPPA, if it's the hormones. We've done enough genetic expression work, I've been to enough conferences that show the same story. It deals with the stress. Whatever that stress is you throw at it, but if you don't fix the stress, the plant dies. And that's where I get validation and data. Because you need a death and you need a growth and you need everything in between. So I thought that was really interesting um, in regards to some of this work that's been done in the fulvic acid, humic acid, soluble organic matter, as well as the plant extracts that I was talking about. Now, what's interesting is, um, page nine, just to kind of close up here, um, I want to make it very clear, biostimulants, hopefully you get it, do not replace nutrition. They complement nutrition, and that's what all the slides, all the pictures on slide nine and the top of slide 10 are talking about, where we did a field day last year where some retailers said, can you grow us new, proper nutrition versus improper nutrition with and without a biostimulant? And that's really what we wanted to show. Probably the best one is the wheat, because I, I think I can read that one, but on page nine in the middle, I think what's really interesting here is that on the left-hand side in the orange one was hardly any fertilizer. The one second from the left was proper nutrition. The one second from the right was a biostimulant by itself. And the one on the far right was a biostimulant plus proper nutrition. And I think that's what it really tries to show. The biostimulant will kind of kick it in the pants to kind of get it going, but if there's no food to feed it, it's, it's a dead duck in the water. And that's what the rest of these slides really want to talk about here. Um, we're fortunate uh, yesterday, um, I think it's tied in with the Farming Smarter group a little, I think Mercer Seeds, um, we actually, 
did some of this work or Mercer Seeds with somebody did some strip trials and that's really what on page 10 is what there are uh, some fields that are out there. I think there was nine different strips put in the field of a seed nutrient dressing, the pre-seed with the biostimulants on it, showing the increased early season vigor. And in this case here, the enhancement of the vegetative stage, primarily due to the fact that it in essence said, I got the proper nutrition, let's cold start that crop because of the biostimulant. And look what's happened, the crop came out of the ground a little quicker, a little bit more vigorous, and we're off to a good start. Doesn't mean that we're gonna set world records yet, it just means that we're off to a good start. And I just thought I'd throw it in because it was a photo we took yesterday, about this time yesterday, showing the advancement. So at the end, page 11, see we got through all 15, I didn't realize there was only 11 pages, um, is that, uh, what word am I gonna use now? I'm not gonna use balanced. Sufficient. sufficient. So once you have sufficient nutrition, I'll coach you for a while and then it'll become my, have you guys ever heard this story about storytelling? Isn't it great? I know Bill, so I, the way you tell a story is, Bill, I'm gonna give you credit even though you don't deserve it. I'm gonna to say tomorrow, I said, I was with Bill in Leftbridge and I heard a new terminology called sufficient nutrition. So I give you all the credit. Then next week when I tell the story, I'm gonna say, when I was down in Leftbridge, I heard this story about sufficient nutrition. Then in three weeks from now, I'll be going, I've been thinking about it, and I think we should use the word sufficient nutrition. <laughs> now the funny thing about it, if you think about it, think about when you hear people telling stories, don't you love the last one, yeah. right? Because you think about when, I, when we hired Daryl, like we hired, we didn't hire Daryl, but we'll just say we hired Daryl, right? We hired Daryl for his knowledge. But doesn't it drive you crazy when Daryl says, when I was at BASF, this is the way we did it. <laughs> See, he's laughing. Doesn't it drive you crazy? You're like, oh, I don't really care about that company. I hired you. But then, then Daryl will get more experience. And he'll go, through my experiences, I've seen that this is the trend of sufficient nutrition. And then you kind of <laughs> like the guy that way. I have no idea what the hell this has to do with these slides. I just like sufficient nutrition. I just want to try to remember it. So that's why I'm saying it over and over again, because it's a hell of an idea that I had next week. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, once you have sufficient nutrition of the 17 essential elements, Tom, thank you for putting nickel on there. And you know, Tom's in trouble from IP and I for doing that because the Canadian government still doesn't acknowledge nickel as an essential nutrition nutrient. So thank you for doing that, Tom. Dr. Patrick Brown and Dr. Woods out of the U.S. actually acknowledged them back in 1986 as essential nutrients, but Canada hasn't acknowledged it as essential nutrients. So that's kind of where we're at in this world. We're still trying to figure out what nutrients are essential. Tom, thank you for doing that. I'm going to quote you on that to get you in trouble with your boss, but that's all right, right? But he's from the U.S. anyway, so it doesn't matter. So he knows nickel's essential. So once you've addressed the sufficient nutrients, all 17 of them, then you got to figure out what do you want to do? What do you want to push? What stress are you going to see? So when you think about biostimulants, think about it as a complement to balanced nutrition. Think about it as a tool to address stress. Stress could be lack of rooting, cold conditions, moisture stress. Heck, flowering is a stress. So what, what biostimulants should you be looking at at flowering with the proper nutrition? And put the two of them together. Um, that's probably enough for now. I gotta change all my slides from balance to sufficient. I'm pretty excited about that. God. Anyways, any questions? I have no idea if this made any sense. Um, at the end of the day, you have, to ex you have to start to embrace the word biostimulant because if suppliers haven't knocked on your doors, I'd be surprised. And there's gonna be a lot more knocking on your doors. And I know that because next week I'm in Saskatoon because there's 14 biostimulant companies coming from England to Saskatoon to pitch Canada on biostimulants. So how do you sort through them all? You, so great question. How do you sort through them all? When we have a biostimulant company come into our office, we have two simple questions. What is it and how does it work? And what that means when they show you a photo in the bottom right hand corner, that's not what it is and that's not how it works. That's the question that we always ask. What's in the product and how does that product work? What you want to get people to do is say, can you please show me your transcription data on RNA sequencing? 
and can you please show me the analytical work that you've done to show me the active ingredient in your product? That's what I ask. And then if I don't know the answer physiologically, I go to really smart people that say that compound, and I'll say, what does that compound do in a plant? And they say X, Y, and Z. And I go, so if that's the case, it's the end result should be that picture. They go, yes. Then we can have a conversation past that. Uh, you know, on the bottom of your label, you want a CFIA registration number. Okay, so again, that's just another check and balance. It goes through CFIA. They take all the data, all the information. There's a lot of guys out there that will cut stuff, and, uh, you know, it's not registered. So that's really important. So, so I think the thing is, ask them what's in it, how does it work, and if they say it works on every crop at every stage in the plant's life cycle and it does a whole bunch of stuff, that's another indication that you should probably do a forest gump. You know what that means, right? Run, forest, run, opposite direction. That's kind of just a metaphor that I like to use as well. Um, this is intimidating. If you don't think it's intimidating, I'd be surprised. Uh, I got engaged in this primarily because 15 or 20 years ago, somebody came to me and said, can you please explain what an auxin is? And I said, nope. But then I got curious. And a curiosity kept going. And then I realized we need to, somebody, everybody needs to understand this just to the point of being dangerous. That's all you got to be. Just get to the point of dangerous. So you can ask good questions and then have a resource or a list of resources that can help clarify that. Um, because these things are coming. Um, I think when we go to the International Biostimulant Conference, I was telling Daryl there was 400 companies at it. 400 companies, 1,200 people. So when you have three coming across your door, you got 398 more to go, or 397, I can't even add up, 397 more to go. This is a space that is complicated. But Are you doing local research trials? Lo uh, local research trials? You know, in terms of those 400 companies, no, no. I mean, because of those 400 companies, to be honest, probably 350 of them, they're local or they primarily focus on fruits and vegetables. And the reason why they focus on fruits and vegetables, not only they're a high value crop, but one of the reasons why is a fruit and vegetable has a distinct flowering period that has a ton of stress on the plant, natural stress on the plant. And... These guys, when they grow these crops, because of their value, they always have sufficient nutrition on. It used to be called balanced nutrition. You guys may have heard that old phrase. Now it's called sufficient nutrition. But because these plants have sufficient nutrition, now they can push the crop harder. And this is one of the questions. When I go to these meetings, I actually met two Spanish, two Spanish companies, and I'll give them a ton of credit. I said, I'm from Western Canada. I'm looking at wheat at your boss stimulant. Do you think it will work? The guy goes, yes. I said, okay, that's the expected answer. I said, if I'm putting on nitrogen and phosphorus and I'm deficient in potassium and magnesium, should I put on your boss stimulant? He says, absolutely not. That's the company we're working with today because that's the right answer. And that's why one of the reasons why they target fruits and vegetables. Multiple applications throughout the season, so multiple passes across the field. A flowering plant is under huge stress, huge nutrient demand. Boss stimulants of these different families bring a lot of value. And I've, I've seen it for many, many companies for years. They work really good when you understand what you're doing once you have sufficient nutrition. Great question. In terms of local research, lots of people are, not lots, there's a few companies doing research, and some of the research is very good. Some of the research is very good. Any other questions? Is everybody really tired? Me too. Yes. So consistent yield advantage by using a product, that's what we're looking for. I mean, so you, you always see pictures of the yep. plants a little more advanced, whatever. But if it doesn't translate to yield. So, you know, this is a great question. Consistency of product and... Yeah. Or of, of results. Of results. So, consistency of results. What I actually find when a biostimulant is put in with nutrition, it doesn't always increase yield more than the nutrition. But what it does do is it creates a better level of consistency. That's kind of the number that we see. I think a great example is when we, is anybody here from Syngenta? Okay, because they, they could help, yeah? 
more consistency because it's addressing some of these anomalies and some of these stresses in a plant. And I think a, a great piece is there's two great scenarios. One of them is when we were doing some work with BASF on soybeans with potassium nutrition and their strobiurelurin product. I think it was called Preax or before that was called Headline. And Daryl, you know these stories. Headline, very good product, created some good results in soybeans, some great results in soybeans, and some of the results that nothing happened. That's kind of a given, right? We work with BSF. BSF summary is that when we were putting on proper nutrition for some of these biostimulants with the headline, it created more consistency in a consistent, predictable performance. And so that's the case. We did the same thing with the Syngenta Seed Care guys for three years, where we were putting on one of the biostimulants that's in with the pre-seed with their, at the time, I guess it was Cruiser Max. And what they were seeing was more consistent performance. Not always more yield, but more consistent performance. So I know that's a kind of a cop out, but I think that's what we normally see. Now, if all your nutrition is all nicely lined up, then I think that's when you push it, push it harder. You can actually push the productivity up. But again, understand the timing. What's the objective? What do you think you want to address? And then work with the right people. Say, do we have the right product there at the right time? Um, again, there are some very good flowering products. You put them on as a seed treatment, they don't work as, as expected. Great question, by the way, which I didn't really answer, but kind of told you some stories. Any other questions? All righty. Let's give this man a hand. Thank you, Jack.